So in all of our communities, uh, in all of our families, <clears throat> one of the three most important expressions, the, three, uh, the, the first two being thank you, please. Uh, the third most important expression uh, is can I help? You know, it's a wonderful thing if you're, if, you're, if you're here in Holy Family and you're doing a particular job and someone walks into the room and says, you know, can I help? Can I help? It's like, oh, wow, it's just, it's so nice. Now, even if they can't or, or can't or couldn't or the fact that they want to and the fact that they would be willing to and very often maybe they can, uh, it's, it's such a wonderful act of service. And it's, it's like a putting into practice <clears throat> of what we heard in our psalm, this idea of uh, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. You know, when I say to someone, can I help? I'm now putting myself such almost subject to their will. You know, if they say, well, yes, you could. Actually, would you mind peeling 14 kilos of carrots? Why did I ask? <laughs> sure, of course I will. Of course I will. You've, you know, I, I offered my services. You said, okay, so now here, here we go. Here we go peeling. Um, so uh, when I, I say, I, can I help? I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying, here I am. I come to do your will. Now, when we do this, with the Lord as well. There are wonderful, I think it's very important that we emphasize this, <clears throat> there are wonderful consequences to saying to the Lord, Lord, here I am, I come to do your will. Because God wants what's best for us. So what he, <clears throat> what he says, what he requires, what he asks of us is always going to be for the maximum of our happiness. Whatever that may be, it's going to be for the maximum of our happiness. So if whatever his vocation is whatever the next step in the formation for that vocation is, whatever God asks of us will be good in the long term. Often good in the short term as well, but always be good because it's God's will. Okay? So it's, it's, it's really important to, to, to keep that in mind when we're discerning or when we're praying or when we're asking the Lord uh, whatever his will is. Uh, ultimately, it will be for our good. So we have nothing to fear in even saying to the Lord, here I am, I come to do your will, in giving him a blank check, giving him permission to guide our lives. <clears throat> St. Paul, in our reading, our second reading, uh, he says something which I think is definitely worth delving into. <clears throat> he says, your own body, as you know, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you since you received him from God. You are not your own property. You have been bought and paid for. And that is why you should use your body for the glory of God. You have been bought and paid for. It's uh, the kind of language that's, that, that's, that's a little uncomfortable because you buy and pay for property. You buy and pay for things. You buy and pay for shoes. Okay, so for you know, the Lord to say, or St. Paul to say through, uh, for the Lord to say through St. Paul, uh, you've been bought and paid for. Uh, it's, 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 it's kind of awkward language for us in the, the 21st century. And yet, if we want to be part of this mystical body of Jesus, if we want to be part of it, like, uh, where does that privilege come from? How is that even made possible? And the Lord has bought us with his blood, right? So he has paid for our sin he has made it possible for us to be part of this mystical body okay now why am i saying these these uh, why am i emphasizing these two points uh this week we had the publication of the mother and baby homes report which is obviously uh, it's, it's one of those uh, chapters of of our history as, as a country and as a church that's very uncomfortable you know one of those truths that uh, it, it, it doesn't make for, for pleasant reading at all. It's, it's shameful. It's absolutely, uh, it's, it's, it should never happen. Th though these kind of things sh should never happen that any woman or child would be degraded or ostracized uh, because of, of, of their past or because of choices that they have made. Uh, it's not, that's not the, 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 the Christian way at all. I think it's very interesting though or very important that when we look at these kind of things when we look at these events of our past and of our history that we we learn from them and find a way of going forward that these things never happen again 
it's, it's what's done generally in society. If there's an accident, if there's an incident, you know, if, if, if there's a health and safety problem, right, the law will be amended in order this can't happen again, right? This is how, it's how we learn from our past. So a problem occurs and we try to, to, to learn from it and move on. Uh, we try to ensure that it never happens again. So how do we, we're looking back at, at this kind of a scenario. The study was done uh, from in Ireland here between uh, 1922 and 1998, the, the, the mothers and babies who were in those homes, there were 14 mother and baby homes and four county homes throughout the country. So they were the ones that were investigated from that time period. And what was interesting about the findings, <clears throat> and I read this in a newspaper that's not particularly church friendly, but the, the, the findings I found were, were, were very interesting because it didn't say, if I'm honest, what I was expecting it to say. The main findings of this report, number one, right, the, the number one most important finding, that responsibility for the harsh treatment of unmarried mothers in Ireland lies mainly with who? I was expecting this just to simply, this report simply just to hammer the church from beginning to end. It says the responsibility for the harsh treatment of unmarried mothers in Ireland lies mainly with the fathers. Lies mainly with the fathers of the children and their own immediate families, but supported by and condoned by the state and the churches. It says many of the homes provided a refuge, even if harsh, it provided a refuge for these women and, and children, while the families provided no refuge at all. Now, so we look at something like that, you know, and we want to, again, we want to learn from this, this never happens again. So I then, as a member of the church, what, when I see this, what, what do I think? What do I see? How can we ensure this never happens again? The importance of men's ministry, the importance of family ministry, that men, sorry, that boys learn to become men, that men learn to be fathers, so that this never happens again, that no woman will ever have to be ostracized or, or suffer in any way. Even, even today now where the state provides for, for single mothers, I'm sure most single moms would still say, I'd really love if he hung around, if he was still here, if he would commit to me and to this child, and if he would say, I will love you until death separates us. If he had ever learned to be a man, to be a father. It says the report finds no evidence that women were forced to enter the homes by either the church or the state. No evidence. There is no evidence. It says most women had no alternative. Many women contacted the state or church agencies seeking assistance as they had nowhere to go and no money. Women were also brought to homes by family without being consulted. So again, something that, that's just very interesting here is that often these kind of reports, rather than learning what must we do if this never happens again? People will actually instrumentalize these kind of reports and use them to beat down the church. So like your atheist groups now will go ballistic with this kind of report and see a typical Catholic church, right? But what I found so interesting about this is just, I mean, do you remember back at the, it was 1989 when communism fell in Romania? Some of, most of you here wouldn't remember that, but you, you, you at home will. When communism fell there in Romania, do you remember the, the images that went out of the Romanian refugees, you can still find them online. Communism fell when uh, Nicolae uh, Ceausescu, when he died in 1989, he was a, and he was communist, right? So this wasn't faith-based, wasn't faith-based. But under communism, he wanted to have, he wanted to boost the population, so he wanted as many kids as possible. But then typical communism, they want as many kids as possible, but they have to be perfect. <coughs> so the less perfect, were pushed out into these homes and left there in horrific conditions where beatings were regular, uh, neglect, malnourishment, no intellectual or physical stimulation, um, hell holes, absolutely horrific stuff that was discovered uh, once, uh, once communism fell and, and uh, the media were allowed in and so on. And it's just so interesting that this, this had nothing to do with faith. This isn't a, a Catholic issue or, or, or an Irish issue. Those of no faith did exactly the same and worse, and far worse. Gandhi famously said, the true measure of society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. The true measure of a society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable. So again, if we want, we want to learn from this, this doesn't happen again. So how do we treat our most vulnerable? 
how do we treat the disabled? How do we treat those with, with Down syndrome? How do we treat those that need particular help? I read a report recently that Down syndrome rates in Europe have, fa have fallen be between, the age, between the years of uh, 2011 and 2015 by over 50%. Do you know what the cure they found was? Abortion. That's how we help them. Are we learning, as a society, are we learning that this kind of thing doesn't happen again? Or is the way that we resolve these problems, so back in the day maybe a, a, a single mother found herself alone, unwanted by her family, and she'd go to a home. Some of the homes took good care of them, some of them didn't. If they didn't, there's absolutely no excusing it. But today, a woman finds herself alone and pregnant. What's our solution? 21st century Ireland? <clears throat> Abortion. Problem solved. Kill the baby. Back in the day, under communism in, uh, in Romania, your child was handicapped, it made the family look bad, it made the state look bad, hide them away in a, an orphanage, forget about them, throw away the key. 21st century Ireland, your child is born with Down syndrome, what's our solution? Our child is diagnosed with Down syndrome. Are we learning? Or do we think that we're just, we're, we're so super modern now and super advanced, but doing exactly the same things under the name of compassion? <clears throat> the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable. You are not your own property. You have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. You should use your body for the glory of God. We, we men, we have such a, such a responsibility. And we as the church, we have so much to do in forming boys to be men and forming men to be fathers. And this is, this is a new kind of ministry here in Ireland. Uh, it's something we're, we hopefully will learn and grow into because it's, it's pretty much non-existent. But we have to pick up the pieces. It's, it's uh, very typical. <coughs> For the Holy Spirit to inspire uh, the church to fill to fill the gaps, fill, to fill in the pieces. When there was no one providing education in Ireland, the Holy Spirit inspires different founders to start religious orders to provide for education. When there was no one providing uh, for hospital care, medical care, the Holy Spirit inspires certain founders to start orders to take care of those in need. And now our, our, one of our greatest needs is just the, the collapse of the family, the family unit with, with uh, divorce rates, Increasing marital rates dropping. Just that, that, that basic building block of society now is so insecure. And so I think the Lord is going to raise up men who will teach men how to be men and how to be fathers. And we as a church have a responsibility in that regard too. But firstly, we live it as priests, that we live as, as men of God, that we live as fathers to our people, and then teach others to do likewise. Never again. This must never happen again. We must learn from our past or we're destined to make the same mistakes again. But we do so knowing that the Holy Spirit lives within us, that we are his temples. For we are not our own property. We have been bought and paid for. And that is why we should use our bodies for the glory of God. Amen.